being here today and once again I'd like to thank our friends in the Central Illinois Media Group. My name is Andrew Rand, I'm Chairman of the Peoria County Board and I will lead off this, uh, this afternoon's update. Uh, one housekeeping note for our loyal viewers and watchers and there are many. Uh, after today our standard briefing time will be at 3.30 in the afternoon instead of the usual 4 o'clock. And if we change that, we'll let you know. But from now on, it will be at 3.30. Following me today will be the director of our public health department, uh, Melinda Hendrickson. And then she will be followed by a very informative presenter, Melinda Cooling, from OSF Health Systems. Uh, thank you, everyone, for continuing to follow the shelter at home uh, request by the governor. In most instances, it's a seemingly simple thing to follow, but for a couple of maybe knuckleheads in the community, uh, I think uh, some of the needs people have to shelter in place is to continue to mix it up and uh, get into some new routine each day that's different, perhaps from the one we've all been accustomed to. I want you to know that there are some people really hard at work and I'd like to call attention to the school superintendents and principals across Peoria County who are actively involved each day in making sure that while the kids aren't at home, they're getting their meals and some sense of regularity and access to the academic environment. They haven't just been dismissed from school. They may be out of sight, but they're certainly not out of mind. And I know in particular, uh, Dr. Karat with Peoria Public Schools and Beth Kreider uh, from the Regional Office of Education here in Peoria County have been uh, working day and night to make sure that our kids are getting meals, nutritional meals, and access to additional adjunctive learning tools. So I want to thank them personally. Uh, <clears throat> I've been inspired by some of the volunteerism. I just want to tell you that whether you know somebody who's delivering something, delivering food, which seems simple, it, it was perhaps a, a major challenge once upon a time for organizations like Meals on Wheels. It's an even bigger challenge now. And I'm inspired by the volunteers and their outpouring in supporting the meal delivery process in our community. I'd also like to recognize that there are individuals who have volunteered to Skype with kids and be active in daycare uh, while other parents in the neighborhood may be working. I think this is an amazing thing to see. And uh, for the rest of the volunteers, I was in our 211 center several times this week, seeing the list of volunteers calling to offer their services to a bunch of organizations. And I want to emphasize that if you have anything to volunteer, please call 211 or 309-999-4029, and perhaps we can connect you with an, a need. So um, <clears throat> the last part for me is to introduce Monica Hendrickson, the health director, and I look forward to her comments today. Peoria, uh, Peoria County uh, and the city of Peoria, as well as Taswell and Woodford are coordinated in this response. And all things are still, all things are go. Please, shelter at home, call someone uh, who needs an ear, and take some time and get some exercise, have a routine, but please continue to shelter in place, and we'll be back tomorrow. Thank you, Chairman Rand. Um, today we'll be only announcing the number of com confirmed positive cases to date for the Tri-County region. The total is 11, with six cases in Peoria County, two cases in Tazewell County, and three cases in Woodford County. This change in reporting is based on wanting to make sure we are sharing meaningful data. As more commercial labs are onboarding, the local health departments are only becoming aware of tests that are negative once those results come in. As for the pending tests, because again, those private labs are now getting more and more uh, utilized in our communities, they're only reflecting those that are from the state of Illinois, which make a small percentage as they are the high priority tests. So again, to make this data meaningful that we share each day, we are only going to be uh, giving out the numbers of those confirmed positive tests, which reflect both private and public lab results. We are working with our healthcare systems to better understand the number of tests uh, that they are doing in those private labs. But again, testing is still limited and we are prioritizing. 
So with that, another great resource we do have in our community is our telehealth services. And I'd like to introduce M Melinda Cooling to speak on what OSF is doing. Great, thank you for having us here. So my name is Melinda Cooling, and I serve within St. Gabriel Digital Health at OSF Healthcare. So we have some great digital tools that we are um, asking our patients and communities to use um, to try to keep our community safe and our patients safe. So one is Claire. Claire is a chat bot that you can find on osfhealthcare.org. You can interact with her and ask her questions. She can also provide education to you about whether you need to be seen. She can also direct you into our OSF nurse hotline where you can talk to a registered nurse 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as well as an advanced practice provider if that would be needed. And so you can call that number at 833-OSF-NO. In addition, we also have what's called the COVID Companion, which is, which is a text app where you can text the number 67634 and text OSF to that number. That text app will give you responses about um, how to protect yourself, new data that's in the community, um, and help you with questions that you may have. In addition, we know that this time, uh, during these times of pandemic, many times patients can have anxiety or depression. We also have an app called OSF, the Silver Cloud, which is supported by OSF, and you can access that OSF Silver Cloud on our website as well. Thank you. And thank you to OSF for providing that support. Uh, UniPoint Health is also has a respiratory triage line, and that number is 309-6802850. Oh, That's 309-6802850, and you can call that for UniPoint for evaluation Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. In addition, as this uh, continues to progress in our communities, uh, it was also noted that today that the Tenth Circuit has postponed uh, jury trials through April as well, and we'll evaluate that um, in the future as well to go back online. With that, I'll, I'll open it up for questions from the group. So one question I have, so we've mentioned Claire, uh, 211, Silver Cloud, I mean, this has been going on now for a few weeks. I mean, have they seen dramatic increases in usage over these last few weeks? Yes, so all of the, uh, the 211, uh, Claire, the telehealth services, um, the triage nursing programs have seen increases. And I think uh, Dr. Jackson spoke a little bit to it on uh, Tuesday, mentioning the fact that from a 911 side, um, they've seen a decrease in certain calls, partly with the understanding that they may be resorting to those services that the healthcare community is providing to assist in triaging, realizing that using 911 for emergency only and accessing those for triage purposes. Can we, can we put a number on how many more calls or how many more users they've seen? So since both systems are just recently going on live, uh, they are working on analytics to determine that value. And I think that's a great data point our community is wanting to be able to share. And I know OSF is looking to share that as well and UniPoint because testing to actually determine, use testing as a way to measure cases in our community is not going to be the strongest indicator. 80% of people are going to be able to stay at home, have mild symptoms, and use Claire or use the UniPoint system to really monitor themselves and stay on target for their health and their improvement. So those are going to be better indicators of what the community-wide is versus our test, because our tests, again, are going to be for those high-priority individuals, uh, those that are hospitalized, where the clinical care matters based on test results. This may be hard to quantify, and you know I know you guys have been saying that for a number of days now, but I think kind of the general public just maybe not be able to quite kind of grasp the idea. Do you have any idea for how many reported cases, how many more we believe could be in the Tri-County area? So I think it's safe to say that uh, a way to look at it is for every one um, and some of the symptomatic, there's about two people in direct contact that can also then have been exposed and also then develop symptoms. So in general, we have 11, and those two we know of, so that's another 22 on top of that, so 33, and then keep going exponentially across the board. That's why things such as social distancing 
and those staying in place really are trying to stop that spread and kind of that next contact over. So it's safe to understand that for every one case, you're easily looking at anywhere from two to five people that have been exposed and could have some type of symptomology. Most, again, will have that mild value. Um, but we do know that from the case that Caswell County announced yesterday, this was one person where there was no clear delineation of a contact history or travel. So based on that, it's really understanding that it is in our community, and we should, again, not be focused on where I got exposed, but assume that you have been exposed. Monica, yesterday it was announced that that man in his 70s is in the hospital. Do we have any updates on his condition? Um, I believe he's still hospitalized. And how come Tazewell County is saying ages and genders, but Peoria and Woodford are still kind of restricted? I, I think we all uh, take in a different lens. Um, I think Sarah Sparkman, who spoke yesterday, said it best, that this is somebody's person. And so with that, um, Talking to that uh, individual that is sick, they understand that we do these briefings. They understand that information is wanted. I mean, so we respect the privacy of them. So one thing that was announced in the, uh, the governor's press conference today is that they, they have announced that Illinois has gotten that federal uh, emergency declaration. What's that mean for this area? That's a great question. I will actually segue that to Scott Sorrell, the county administrator. Thanks, Monica. Uh, so, Tim, to your question, what that means is uh, a whole host of uh, things open up for us. Uh, we're, we're already in a position where we're tracking our expenditures and our payroll costs to make sure that uh, when we're able to, the window opens up and we can start applying for reimbursement for the government's costs, we can do that. But also uh, seeing what the federal government did and what has done and what the governor did yesterday, uh, you know, there's going to be small business uh, revitalization programs that are going to be able to funnel through either the city of Peoria and other municipalities or the county of Peoria uh, that will be able to, to provide assistance to our local businesses as well. So at this point, there is, the, the gates have opened, so to speak, in helping out these local businesses to stay afloat during this, this stay-at-home period? Correct. Uh, one specific example uh, that is in the governor's programs from yesterday is a small vis business revitalization program uh, that is going to use community development block grant dollars uh, that – uh, the city of Peoria gets on an allocation every year, but they're the only municipality in Peoria County that does. In fact, the county doesn't get that either. So we're going to uh, apply for those dollars, uh, and uh, those dollars can go directly as grants to businesses that have 50 or fewer employees uh, within the county. Do you have any idea, I'm not sure if you would even know this answer, but you know, driving around, i got to say, for a stay-at-home order for the state, I see a lot of people driving around, and I know we are, you know, a medical town, so obviously a lot of essential personnel. Any idea of the percentage of the population in the county that's considered essential? Uh, you know, that's a really good question. We haven't uh, counted those numbers, but uh, just as a baseline, on a per capita basis, we have one of the largest uh, percentages of healthcare workers of any region in the country. Uh, so naturally, we're going to have a lot of uh, essential employees that are tied to healthcare. Uh, one, uh, I think one key data point, though, that uh, we uh, pushed out yesterday to all of uh, uh, the team members at Peoria County government is that uh, if, uh, if you track cell phone usage, uh, Peoria County is seeing a 39% decrease in the mobility of cell phones. Now, that's a medium kind of indicator because not everyone has a cell phone, but for those that do, 39% of us are... Uh, being less mobile, which means that we actually are staying at home and sheltering in place, as the governor has asked us to do. So how are you able to do that? I mean, is that location services? I mean, how are you able to track that? So, that's, so the government's not doing that. That's big business tracking all of us, and it was a, 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 a business entity that published that data. Anything else? I have questions for Monica. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, what we're learning, not just from the Chicago area, but what's happening in New York and also what's happening in New Orleans as well, is that there is a lot of planning going on in terms of just understanding as a, as a hospital system what our capacities are, what our surge capacities are, and what does that look like. 
Um, I know the state has requested uh, data points from the hospitals, uh, more so than usual to start monitoring that on a daily basis to understand everything from number of beds, ICU capacity, um, to really kind of see where we are at in terms of that curve and are we, uh, all the measures we've talked about, those non-pharmaceutical interventions we've been doing, has really, has it helped us fund the curve here locally? You know, when we talk about hospital restrictions, I know one thing that uh, I've been thinking about, and especially parents, when we have kids in the hospital, what are restrictions in terms of that? And what if a kid were to be sick with the coronavirus, would a parent be allowed to go with them to the hospital? So um, with minors, there is um, the ability to have a guardian or, um, or a parent and so forth at those hospitals with them. Again, wanting to limit that as much as possible. So is it um, both parents at the same time? It, do they have to rotate? Those are kind of those considerations, as well as hospitals are doing uh, checks, not only on uh, patients that are coming in, but even themselves. Uh, having staff do active monitoring at home prior to coming to a shift, and then throughout their shift, even monitoring for symptoms to make sure that um, they're able to catch it early without necessarily having uh, further transmission. Do we have any idea how much PPE our local hospitals go through, say, in a day, and then how that might change you know, as the number of coronavirus cases is that's a great question about how much PPE we have in a day and that can change. The issue with PPE and how that can change is they have a really good understanding of daily operations, which is outside of the world of pandemic. Um, but there have been a lot of guidelines on how to conserve, reuse, um, extend the shelf life of their PPE. And so with that in mind, they don't necessarily know how that would play for the current levels. They know when we're not in a pandemic mode what that is, but now with all these um, uh, waivers and extensions that they're able to do, that can you know, change their usage and their turnaround. Uh, there was an assessment tool that was pushed out not only to hospitals, but to long-term care facilities, um, dentist office, you, know, you name it, that utilizes PPE to kind of monitor and watch what that capacity is. Again, the state is doing a great job trying to give tools and resources to our hospital and our first responders so that they can monitor. And then when they need those additional uh, resources, being able to push that to the Illinois Ma Management Agency and request those additional PPE. Monica, a big question right now that I've been seeing a lot of is the number of tests and testing. Is there a projection on when a good amount of tests will be here where it's not restricted to those just hospitalized? That's a great question about when we'll have enough tests. And uh, I wish it was tomorrow. I think we all do. Um, with that being said, every week we get additional testing. The backlog for the state has definitely um, cleared up and now it's a much more faster turnaround. Even our private labs are also onboarding quicker. And so as this progresses week by week, uh, we are getting more and more tests. The key thing to understand though is just because you have a test doesn't necessarily change your outcome. Um, it really is focused for those individuals where the health care and their treatment will matter based on a positive or negative test result. But for the majority of individuals, you're not going to do anything different than stay at home, self-isolate, and take care of yourself. Speaking of PPE, we've got a lot of people in the community who want to do something, and they're making cloth masks. Um, there's been some debate about how useful those masks are, but I saw Unity Point actually put a pattern out online today on how to make them, so that's making me think that they are more useful. What's the verdict on that? So a lot of the cloth masks is um, to put on top of already existing PPE to extend the shelf life of your PPE to, again, create another barrier to prevent any damage or anything from making your mask dirty. So again, trying to further extend the life of our product. I mean, that's the key thing with the, uh, the request for those masks is to extend it as much as possible. So think of it as another layer to put on to keep those other masks uh, working longer and in service. Because I understand um, like some first responders have been requesting them from these women who are making them in Fulton County yeah. and they're using them. I mean, I guess it's better than nothing. And again, I think a lot of it is trying to extend what they have their stock of. Okay. Uh, the state did ask for um, different offices that may use or different uh, businesses that use PPE. Think of like a tattoo parlor, anyone that has PPE to donate. And you can actually uh, send those donations to ppe.donations at illinois.gov. And again, just to reiterate that here locally, we have a strong 211 that's taking donations for volunteers, for other additional resources as well. Uh, the Community Foundation is assisting with financial donations, and so both locally and the state, uh, donation is going to be a strong thing. It just proves that Illinois is really giving. 
So one thing we've heard about PPE in the national media from like New York and other places are a little harder hit is you have some doctors who are being forced to reuse face masks or re-sterilize them, the effort to get more life out of them. Is that something that's happening here or is supply adequate to avoid that this time? Uh, currently, supply is adequate, but again, those are all strategies for certain masks to extend their lives. Um, certain masks are able to be re-sanitized as well as can be used for multiple usage. Um, some of our hospital systems will assign a face mask by entity, by individual, or by room. So that is that face mask for when you enter that room. So you're not necessarily disposing back and forth, but you know that when I enter room one, that's going to be my mask that I wear for that one and maintain it for a longer period of time. And all that guidance has been shared to all of our providers in our area. Sure. You know, we, you know, when we hear the governor speak and he's announcing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of new confirmed cases, and you know, we're not seeing those numbers locally. Is it because there's a major mismatch between tests available upstate versus central and downstate? I don't think it's a testing mismatch. I think it's understanding where the spread started. And really, our first cases were being identified in a large metropolitan areas where people and population is close together. Uh, I think there was a great graphic that the New York Times showed of China and just understood how people movement from high concentration areas really mimic the same movement of the virus. And so seeing it in our large uh, cities, New York City, Chicago, New Orleans, uh, LA, is not surprising. Um, having said that, though, we, the fact that we've had cases and it's not in the same flux just shows how some of those non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as, you know, social distancing, staying in place, really do matter. Just one question for you, Monica. Um, we've been at stay-at-home order for a couple of days now. We still have, you know, a week or so left um, until April like, well, 7th, 8th. Um, when will we start seeing if what we're doing here in Central Illinois is flattening that curve? When will we see those results? Uh, that's a great question. When we'll see the results of sheltering in place. And so uh, I think part of that is why the state has been requesting those additional data points from the hospitals, because those are going to be milestones that we can see improvement on um, sooner than later versus case numbers, right? Because case numbers are attached to your tests, and if we don't have enough tests, it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, having said that, though, any intervention is going to be as good as how well you follow up, right? If your doctor tells you that you need to take a course of antibiotics, it works because you take that full course of antibiotics. Uh, eating healthy only works if you choose to eat healthy. Same with this. The better we comply with these orders, the better the intervention works and the shorter time we have to stay in a sheltering in place. So again, it's a difficult time period, but if we can do it and do it well, the chances are we might not have to stay in this as long as we need to. What would the situation look That's a great question, and I think even at the health department, we're talking about how do you go back online, so to speak. And it's going to be a slow progression, partly because we even saw this in China when they did start relaxing some of those uh, shelter-in-place issues, they saw cases come back. So we want to make sure we're continuously monitoring and understanding what that gradual uh, revving back up looks like. I know one of the things that the governor allowed was for you know people that were retired nurses, for example, to allow to rejoin the medical field to help in the front lines. Uh, do we have any idea if this is happening a lot here locally? So since uh, for a few years now, there has been a medical reserve corps, or MRC, that different counties are a part of, and we've always asked for volunteers. Uh, in 2009, during the H1N1 vaccination program, a lot of our medical uh, reserve corps, or MRC, came back to assist with giving out vaccines or assisting with doing screenings as well. So they've been active in our community, and I think it just shows the great need that we have and what, a, what amount of capacity issues we might be dealing with here in the days to come. And I, again, thank all the volunteers that are willing to put themselves back in this role. Some of them would consider themselves high risk, but understanding the importance of what they're doing. Is that medical reserve corps at like Peoria Chapel Woodford? How, how big does that care, uh, cover? Um, it actually covers, uh, most counties actually have them, so every county has them. Some of them have a few volunteers, but they all are attached to, usually to a local health department unit. And then um, here we have a large uh, volunteer group, not only from the MRC, but even through the both hospital systems. So we had two new cases today? Uh, yes, one in Peoria and one in Tazewell. Okay. And do we know if they are related to travel or? So the one in Peoria is related to contact tracing. Uh, the one in Tazewell is still under investigation. Okay.
And I know we spoke about this a bit yesterday, but I think sometimes, you know, the everyday person may not understand why they can't know what exact community these cases are from, if you could just reiterate. So I agree. I know that people want to know more information, understand their own risk. So I think I'll take this in two parts. The first is, these are patients. They have a right to their privacy. Their families are involved. Their families are often quarantining as well. And so understanding that, understanding they're someone's loved one and they're going through this, which is a difficult challenge, uh, and they're only going through their own emotional aspects, we want to protect their privacy and that understanding. On the other side, in terms of for the general public, it doesn't matter anymore. I think the best way to understand this is it is in our community. Rather than trying to identify who the person is or who I can say, that's the reason why I have it, that doesn't exist anymore. It's within our community, and we really need to start focusing from whether or not I've been exposed to that, I have been exposed, and start acting like that. You mentioned a few days ago that one person is actually close to recovery. Um, what's an update on that? Um, I, so we're still, this is actually one of the first ones, and so we're still monitoring it and understanding um, what that transition looks like for them. I think it's too soon to tell. We don't know. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll see you guys tomorrow at 3.30.